I attempted to explain it, but I'm sure I screwed it up, so maybe cool. you could better explain. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I was saying was that once we set this, there's only one way that the cam is ever going to exist mechanically relative to the crank, and I'm sure well, there's a lot more technicality I left what out. What we're doing is verifying that the cam is in the position that it's supposed to be. Okay. Here's your cam card. Okay, there's all your specs. Set the cam to ground on 110, low, 110 degree lobe centers. Mm -hmm. And then we put it in at 106, which is four degrees advanced. Okay. Which is gives you gobs more bottom end and oh, it probably, you'll lose a little bit of top end out of that, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's gonna be a big deal. But if you were all out race motor, this gives you the information that says that's where you were. And, okay. the, and you got out there and all of a sudden, well, you got plenty of bottom end, but you need some more top end. Mm -hmm. Then you pop the front of the motor off and, and move the cam around in order to get everything set up where it's supposed to be. Okay. The farther, farther retarded the cam shaft running, the more top end and mid range you got. So you advance okay. it bottom end and mid range up to probably, well, I don't know, 5,500 or so. Okay. And realistically, it's, it shouldn't be twisted tighter than that anyway, so. Right. How do we know where 110 is? That's what the degree wheel <laughs> yeah, tells us? Yeah, that's what this is all about. And I don't know how we got so lucky, but it's right exactly where we want it to be. Huh. Which is line up the dots. Okay. Let's see here. This indicator's coming up, getting the piston. Okay, so the piston's coming at the zero. top center. Mm -hmm. She's a zero. Mm -hmm. It's really nice to have this piston up here instead of yeah. down like this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like we had before. Yeah, no more 7 16 <laughs> of an inch missing. So, okay, you're setting a zero there. Okay. And you set your pointer here to zero. Okay. And you rotate the motor around. Okay. We can tell by our timing marks that we're getting pretty close. Okay, so now we're watching this again. Okay. All right, and these are the timing marks right there and right there. Mm -hmm. the gears. See right there. So now we're back to zero. Okay, you're back to zero. Your timing marks are here and here. Okay. You have to be careful. See you. Your uh, cam gear's got the mark on it. That's pretty easy to keep track of. Mm -hmm. But if you look in here, you've got a mark at the keyway, and then you got a mark over here. And sometimes guys are not used to doing it, mm -hmm. and they put this in there, and then they make the mistake of using this to line up with that, oh. and it throws it all out of whack. Okay, I see the mark on the keyway mm -hmm. with the open and circle. And you see here. Right. This was marked A, and mm -hmm. this was marked A. So if you were going to advance the cam, you'd pull this gear off and turn it around and put that A right over oh, okay. the gear a for or the advanced. keyway. Uh huh. And then this A would be your new timing mark in relationship to here, and vice versa. If you're going to retard it, it's mm -hmm. marked R over there, and you, and you wind up backing it off the other direction. Okay. So it's the solid filled in dot. Is that pretty much standard for all lower cam gears? Yeah, well, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, of a performance nature. I okay. mean, you know, stock stock setups, just dot to dot. There you go, you get what you get. And hopefully you're happy. Can I okay. show you okay. that question you're about to ask? All right. <laughs> <laughs> the stock timing setup, you only got one keyway. Right, okay. okay. And sometimes the keyway will line up with the dot. Okay. But generally they don't. So in this instance, this would line up like that. That's a stock type setting and the way you go in the fifth, you know. Right. And the thing of it is, we gotta check each one of these because there's too many variations that are possible. Can you degree a cam like that with a stock setup or do you have to? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, you gotta have the specs on the cam and that's pretty iffy. Anyhow. Now that we've figured out where zero is, where top dead center, you just make sure I go around until you see this one moving. 
Right, because this is riding on So this riding on the intake lobe okay. of number one. So it's always the intake lobe? Mm-hmm. Okay. And you watch this. In your question the other day, you were saying, okay, what's this 50,000 stuff about? Right. Okay. You got this set up at, at the very farthest, the highest point that that cam's left in. Okay? Right, so this is the highest That's point zero. right now. And then you go 50 thousandths on either side. So you pull this on around, we'll go back around and catch it on the front side. But okay. Okay, you're going to 50 thousandths. So the cam just rotated that way, mm -hmm. clockwise. Now you away. come back up here to this 135. Okay. Okay. Coming out. Okay, we're still running up on zero. Mm -hmm. Now we're watching this. Okay, right now we're coming up on the zero mark, the highest point. Highest point of the cam. Yeah, so okay. that's 50 thousandths before the peak of the camshaft. And you take this number here. Okay. 76. Mm hmm. And like 70, 75.7. Uh, mm hmm. Okay, bring it back up here. You don't worry about that number. Okay, bring it back over here. Oh, so you go to the 50 on the other zero. side. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you take this reading here. Okay. Okay. Then there's a formula that you take those numbers. I get my chicken scratch and show you. Okay. Okay, here's our formula. Okay. You take this first number, the 76. Right. Okay. And then you take your biggest number, which is 135. You take right. 135 minus the 76 is 59. Mm -hmm. You divide it. By two, mm -hmm. and it equals 29.5, and you add that back to the 76, that brings us to 105.50. Set the cam at 106. Okay. So we're, we're a half a degree. Sure. By the time that chain stretches that much, you have to be sitting right on 106. Let's say it was at 110 or something, what would mm -hmm. we do? Would you skip a, a tooth on the oh, no. gear? Or? Oh, that's a whole bunch more than that. Now there's several ways around this. Okay. Uh, actually, keyway that's in your crank, they actually make one of these that's offset a okay. couple degrees, and depending on whether you put it this way or this way, oh, it moves the gear back the gear. and forth another way. Okay. Because on these three bolt cams, mm -hmm. you take it back off and you drill this uh, hole out where the dowel pin goes. Okay. And then you take one of these bushings. Oh, I can see it's offset. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And they make them either one, three, five, and seven. Mm -hmm. We put that back in that hole, check it again. You can move this thing around. And you push it back and forth a few degrees. And if you use this offset bushing, mm -hmm. then you press it. When you get it where it needs to be, then you uh, drill this hole out big enough so that this will go in. Okay. Push it into place. Tighten your bolts down, double check it again, make sure it didn't change on you. And then you go in and take a center punch and stake it in three or four spots and lock that into play. And that's how you're wind up adjusting your cam timing. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, if there's a, I don't remember, it's like one, one tooth is like 20, well, it depends on the time you set to how many gear, teeth you got on the gear, but one tooth would be like 20 degrees, which throws you way the heck oh. out of whack. So it's amazing. This is a really gradual adjustment. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. We'll see this one. Stretch, well, it doesn't take much stretch to make up like this much difference. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's just through your camp six degrees out of time. You one, so it's very, very slight. And then this one's seven degree, but that's yeah. seven degrees. But you think. You know, in that 
right circumference of everything and everything else of that little tiny bit will make the difference between having it doing what it's supposed to do and just have one that'll run right and uh, the, the variables you got to look at and this is really I mean everybody's got plus or minus tolerances depending on what that is whether it's uh, you know standard size say is this size two thousandths under is this two thousand you know and anything in between two thousand or one thousandths under one thousandths over that's still considered standard in most cases okay but yet uh, so you just got to double check this now you got the this keyway that's cut from the factory right okay you figure that if they miss that thing say Thirty thousandths, which is yeah, about like that. Mm -hmm. Well, by the time you times that to this and times that to this, all of a sudden your cams way out in left field. Well, right. If that's uh, that's the case, all right, then you know you may wind to have wind up having to put a seven degree offset bushing here mm -hmm. to get it to come out what your cam card says it's supposed to be. But at least you know that that's where it is. Okay. And, uh, but then, you know, and then you've got the keyway that's cutting in this gear, mm -hmm. okay? You could be off one way or the other there. The camshaft, when they drill with the centering pinhole and that, they could be off a little there. And the guys that make the gear could be off a little bit. So, I mean, I've had some engines uh, that we checked and put them in a straight up position like this one is. Thank goodness this is a good tight chain. Mm -hmm. High quality chain, everything's gonna work out fine. But I've had some of them that uh, I think 10 degrees out just right as the get go. Yeah. And, and uh, I might, you know, it doesn't matter who, what brand of motor it is, it'd be Ford, Chevy, Mopar, Rambler, I don't care. You just gotta check them because uh, if you don't, you, you know, you, you may know. not be happy with the way the motor's running, but you haven't got any. Thing to back it up with, and right. sometimes if you go in there and, and see your cams off 10 degrees, especially the, and the higher compression ratio of the motor is, the closer the pistons and valves are together. And if you got one that was way out in the beginning, and, you, and then you went in and advanced the camshaft, then you might start smacking valves and pistons together. Okay. So you've got to keep all that in mind in order to right make everything come out great but because uh, you might if you don't degree your cam you might start trying to chase it with ignition timing but it's yeah, never going to still yeah. run right no it's uh, you know and then there again with the compression ratio the higher the compression ratio the more critical the, the ignition timing is also in the amount of advance mm -hmm. and uh, it's just all got to be there or else you're going to make a lot of noise but that's about it yeah <laughs> right so explain to me again with with the cam, when we in our application for bottom and mm -hmm. mid range, you said you wanted a little bit more advanced. Advanced at this, especially at this altitude, the air is thinner. Mm -hmm. So most everybody, uh, you know, unless they've got a specific setup that they've tried and run and everything else, and, and they like it better the other way. But most most of your camshafts, as they're advertised, are ground with four degrees advance already built into. Them. Right, so that means those so, valves are going to start opening four degrees before yep. the piston reaches top dead mm -hmm. center. Yep, they're going to be there just a little bit sooner, which which in turn by the intake valve opening sooner, you're going to build more cylinder pressure. Okay. Which basically is tricking the motor into thinking it's got more compression. Do you need to match ignition timing with that then? Because if you have oh, yeah. air... Oh yeah, but basically, you know this is all here and you know, distributor of if you have some issues or you want to try something a little different, a faster, or slower, right. uh, advanced curve in it, or uh, or the amount of advance that you finally wind up with, you can do as far as limiting, you know, the higher the compression ratio, the less advance in the timing in the ignition timing that it'll tolerate. Right, because then unless you use a really really good fuel and you right. know, it, it all works out together, but. Thank goodness in this uh, instance, with all the other backup things that we have going on here, that uh, at least the timing assembly came right in and 
it's pretty time you consuming by the time you get all this stuff put together and you're you know, dial this in, and then go in and dial that in, and then come in and dial this in, and, but... Just uh, to check. Yeah. Right. And cool. a lot of guys will change this timing at the track or something like that. Hmm. Uh, they've got a lot more experience than I do, because I... <laughs> I'll be damned if I can understand how they can feel good about the switch that they've made. Yeah. Uh, where you you know you you're sticking something in a spark plug hole to find top dead center. Right. Okay, it's hard enough to find all that stuff when it's out here on the stand and you get good light, full access to it. But right. So man, hey, if it works for them, God bless them. <laughs> <laughs> so with this motor, you said we're we're getting 10.4 to one compression. Uh, did... I haven't CC'd the heads. I don't know what they are, but uh, okay. I think you're right. Uh, Right in that neighborhood. So we realistically, get, that's determined by with the piston at top dead center, mm -hmm. the valve relief's minus the relief in the mm -hmm. backs of the head. That's how yeah, we and then the, the deck height, which is distance from the top of the block to the top of the piston, and, and that's all the way up. If I remember right, we've milled to uh, so like three. Or I think we pulled about twenty-five thousandths off the deck surface on this thing. Right. And then uh, what they call the compression distance, which is the distance from the center of the wrist pin mm -hmm. to the top of the piston. Okay. Uh, if you use a stock type aftermarket piston, every time you increase the bore diameter because of federal law, and you figure out how that works, <laughs> uh, <laughs> they don't want you increasing the compression ratio in the motor. So if you have a piston or a motor say that's uh, you check it before you tear it down. Okay, you're setting 60 thousandths down the hole with a standard bore diameter. Mm -hmm. But you ordered the same type piston in a 30 over bore because you're going to clean the bore up and right. put new pistons in it. Well, realistically, if the piston was made identical to the stock one except for the overbore size, mm -hmm. then the compression ratio would go up because you've got more volume. Okay in the circumference of that piston and up. So the government says, no, we don't want that. Mm -hmm. So on a piston, oversize, then they cut this compression distance down. Uh, so at the end of the day, you wind up with the same c compression ratio as what it would have been from the factory. Right. But these performance pistons, and uh, especially the real high dollar ones, JE's or Aries or Ross or whoever, you can actually, uh, specify what that distance is and if you want it to uh, if you've got the equipment to measure from the center of the crank to the top of the deck and you cut it and you didn't make it square mm -hmm. and, you, and then you check all that out and you find out god i should have taken twenty thousandths more off of it mm -hmm. well if you relay that information to the guy that's building pistons he can make them twenty thousandths taller mm -hmm. and there you are you don't have to re go back and re-machine the block okay and what if the block was machined to the point that now the piston was sticking just slightly above deck? Is that, mm -hmm. Does well, that ever happen? Well, there's two happen? ways to compensate for that. Either cut the piston, yeah. order the pistons that much short, mm -hmm. or go to thicker head gaskets. Okay, right. Uh, Comic, and there's, there's a lot of uh, gasket manufacturers nowadays out there, especially with the... Uh, all this late model stuff using the multiple layer gasket. It used to be out of a shim steel and a composition gasket. Mm -hmm. The shim steel would be around oh, 10 to 15 thousandths thick. Mm -hmm. uh, your shim steel, or I mean your composition gasket would be in the neighborhood of 50 thousandths thick. We're using composition, right? Yeah, uh huh. Mm -hmm. But the uh, and part of that, I'm sure, goes back to the government deal too, because they figure, okay, the guy's rebuilding the motor, he's going to mill the heads, he's going to mill the block. All of a sudden, we got more compression. Mm -hmm. eh, put a fatter head gasket on it, drag it right back down. Right. But at the end of the day, the composition type gasket is a lot more forgiving, especially for guys that are building the motor that don't surface the block. Right. You surface the head, straighten it back out. And uh, they've already, like Felpro, has done a wonderful job of, of uh, putting 
impregnating a gasket with sealer all the Teflon and hmm. God knows what gorilla snot and whatever <laughs> yeah. know, in there. But it really makes them seal up very good. And, sure. and that way, uh, the other thing too is anytime you take material off of this surface, then when your intake manifold goes to set down, your heads have dropped, so the distance between there, right, you may run into a problem with that. Well, you got to machine your intake. General run in the mill situation, your mill heads enough to clean them up. You don't try and, you know, take a hundred thousandths off of them. So you use a bigger gasket. Put this back in when you go to put the intake manifold on. You don't know any better. Plop it fits. You're probably not in trouble. And down the road you go. Right. Otherwise, you'd have like a port mismatch on your intake mm -hmm. to the head or something. And that's one thing we, I mean, we got to check all that stuff on these. Hmm. Uh, you know, that's, uh, there's ways around it, but generally speaking, you've either got to machine the intake surface of the head mm -hmm. or you got to mill intake Back surface the intake. on the manifold. Right. Okay. And then this distance here will change too because anything that raise or lower that manifold, this is going to change. Mm -hmm. Originally, they had a rubber gasket across here. Uh, and this this motor isn't that big of a deal because this one actually has a valley pan right. for an intake gasket. So it comes down across all this, seals this all up, and then back up and seals against the heads on both sides. Mm -hmm. And then it bolts down here. Where a Chevy and most of the Ford stuff, they've got a big rubber gasket that went across here. Yeah. And some of them actually had holes drilled in them. And, uh, but you start messing with the deck of the block, the surface of the heads, any of that stuff changes the location on the manifold, then this area here will go down. Mm -hmm. You put it together, it's tighter than it's supposed to be. So it cinches up, okay, you don't think anything about it. Well, a few thousand miles later, it spits it out. Oh, well, now you got <laughs> massive oil leak. Right. Somewhere back in, God, I don't know, it must have been in the, probably the early 80s. Uh, a lot of guys to cure that, they'd go in and drill a bunch of small holes or even take a center punch and peen across here so it gives the gasket a little more to hang on to. Hmm. And then it was common to use uh, weather strip cement, you glue that rubber down in there Hmm. So you have basically had a bond all the way across. Yeah. But if they were too far off, then there's still so much pressure on it would it eventually split the gasket hmm. and it still pooches out and away you go. Yeah. And out the back side, I don't know how many guys put rear main seals in the motor because they're getting oil over the back of the motor. Well, you follow it up, guess what? Right. Remain seals fine. Yeah. <laughs> Puking out here and running down. Gotcha. Oh, and a lot of the engines also had, like this one, that's where your oil pressure sending unit is. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of them had gone to electric gauges by then. Mm -hmm. Well, that diaphragm and air ruptures and starts puking out here and down the block it goes and you think it's really mean you got a big mess and yeah, if you don't know what you're doing, you're tearing the pan off and getting into here. And that's really not the problem. The other thing was running into there again back in the 80s, probably. Finally figured it out that when you put your vibration dampener on, it's got this keyway cut in it. Mm -hmm. And if the engine in the what we'll call old days, sure. uh, you didn't have a PCV system. With right. positive crank, crankcase ventilation. So you take your vacuum out of the intake manifold and run it through a valve down into the uh, crankcase of the engine and it's sucking that pressure and vapor out of there and it's running it back through the intake manifold and, and reintroducing it into the engine and burning it and out as the exhaust it goes. Well, back in the old days, they, didn't, they hadn't figured that out yet. So sure. an engine would run, and especially when it got uh, uh, some miles on them, getting a little wear on them, the, uh, that internal pressure has got to be vented someplace. Yeah. And it will find the simplest way to get out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like your dog. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, so they put what everybody referred to as a road draft tube, which actually was just a vent to let that pressure out. Okay. Well. 
you get then you're getting blow by what they call blow by which is compression past the pistons and rings mm -hmm. it pushes down into the crankcase okay where's it going to go well, it comes up vents out that blow by tube mm -hmm. well and it's carrying a certain amount of oil with it and the, the looser the motor gets the more that stuff comes out of that tube and i mean i've seen cars back in the day when they'd have a it was leaking so damn bad they'd have a big piece of rubber hose on it and lead halfway back the car so <laughs> put the drip out here not <laughs> not up here yeah well now with thank goodness with pcv v systems that's one of the, another reason why they created electronic ignition because it uh, increases the spark and the temperature in the, in the chamber and when you're reintroducing all that vapor back into the carburetor it burns it a lot better and, and there you don't have smoke where normally you know if you had a, maybe a point type distributor and stuff low voltage thing in it well then uh, it would uh, it would tend to smoke and and be a bad thing so there have been a lot of improvements but it basically best part about it is is, is it relieves the internal pressure of the engine and saves a lot of wear and tear on the uh, front rear main seals gotcha. especially so Dude. when you get back to this keyway what it's going to tell you before i got lost <laughs> went off there in left field is this keyway as it builds pressure in the engine mm -hmm. the oil will actually get pushed right up this keyway oh. into the in, into the uh, vibration dampener and then it starts throwing it out all over your belts and everything else mm -hmm. in front of the motor huh. and there again people think well it's got to be that rubber seal Hmm. And I think this motor and a lot of other motors have uh, what they call an oil, an oil slinger, slinger, which is a right. big flat piece of... Yeah, I've seen it, right. But anyhow, we put that on, which basically deflects the oil away. Yeah. But it, when you, once you get everything put together, it's a real good idea to just take some a gob of silicone, smash it, you know, on the in, uh, inside of the vibration dampener here, mm -hmm. just to create a plug here so that if the oil ever got worked up to that point it would be a block so that it couldn't come out and go around the hmm. thing so cool how do we run a pcv with this engine do we just go off one of the valve covers back into the intake yeah mm -hmm. and through a pcv valve and then you've got to have a vent somewhere whether you know in the valve covers right i think on this one which basically then they've got to be filtered basically a filtered cap yeah. You see the holes here mm -hmm. and then this has got a packing inside of it so we're sitting here outside air gets sucked in through here all through this filter mm -hmm. and then down through the motor and the pcv sucking out of the other side mm -hmm. bring it back around in the back of the carburetor or direct into the intake manifold this keeps dirt from getting into the motor and a lot of engines you'll you know lift the hood and start looking at them we'll see out of the valve cover a piece of hose or a formed elbow whatever mm -hmm. it comes up and plugs into the air cleaner itself yeah well those and there's generally a little filter about that big mm -hmm. that sits on the inside radius of the stock air cleaner right and and there again it's sucking it inside of the air cleaner through that uh, filter and down through the motor and the performance uh, air cleaners you don't have room for that right so they usually got an adapter that you drill a hole poke it in the bottom side so it's actually getting filtered through the uh, air filter mm -hmm. and then run it back through the motor and keeps everybody a lot happier oh cool we'll pull to put that on there and then we'll uh, check the cam for clearance you don't want this riding on the cover okay mm -hmm. ideally if you got six thousandths in play it's not going to affect the lifters okay uh per se but you don't want it but what you're doing is controlling the end slop on that which if this is this is solid okay mm -hmm. this thing able to go back and forth the, the uh, angle of the gear on the distributor which goes down through there drives the oil pump Right. The angle of that gear has a tendency to pull a camshaft back, but under, you know, acceleration, deceleration, you let off, all of a sudden everything 
kind of changes the load pattern on it and it tries to push this forward. Right. A uh, stock type timing chain is a lot more rigid this way. Okay. Okay. Uh, they're, they're not near as strong as these are, uh, but these are give a little more f flexibility side to side. Mm -hmm. So it has a tendency to make it, let it walk a little further. Okay. On a roller lifter motor, you definitely got to do that. But it's a good idea on any motor. Some some motors from the factory already have that hmm. built into them. Some of them nothing more than a little, uh, probably a Delrin button and a spring. Okay. Something there that just puts a light, little teeny bit of pressure on it. Holds it back here. Well, there's a big load surface behind this gear that rides right up on the front of the block. Mm -hmm. And if you get too much pressure on this. Then it causes this gear to dig into the front of the block, and before long, you've got great unhappiness going on there, too. Yeah. How do you install the cam button? What's holding it in? Well, actually, this one just presses in, but with the okay. figure that timing chain cover is going to be right here, and there's no way. The old valve guide used to just be smooth on the top. Mm -hmm. I didn't think much to pull these off of there. These have got groove machine in them, so it's harder to. The steel's got. You can use the outer, the dampener, or the inner.